opportunity to be here with you guys um, for these services today. It's a it's a incredible. The pleasure is mine. It's an incredible opportunity. But I just want to commend them for what they're building. I mean, to be a church that's five years old. I love church planting. Um, I don't know if you guys uh, have have realized it, but even as a five year old church, you're still a relatively new plant. I mean, this is just the beginning of what God is going to do in Gainesville through City Light, and uh, and just and I mean, you guys have been through COVID together. <laughs> You guys have been through a lot of hard obstacles together, and um, but the statistics show that across the board in America, uh, it's the the newer churches that are actually bringing in the majority of lost people. Um, and not to say anything about traditional churches, because we need we need all the churches we can get. We need there's not enough churches to hold the amount of people that we have that really that for the need that's there. But I just I just think that Pastor Josh, Allison, Dominic. Kaylin, all of your leadership here, Ken in the back, the guys that are working the sound booth, the band. Can we give all these guys a hand real quick? I mean, it's just an incredible team. You're... You're really part of such an incredible church, and I hope that you know that. It's, it's a rare thing, and don't take it for granted, to, to, to see the people that are around you and, and to be led by the people that are, are doing this. It's not normal. It, it's, it's very difficult to do, uh, and, and, and these guys are doing it, and, and you're doing it as a congregation. And so I commend you, and I thank you for the opportunity to be here with you. Uh, let's have some fun together. Uh, the first service, we... Uh, we, we were uh, talking a little, we were, it was a totally different message, okay? They are connected in a way together, but, um, but feel free to go back and, and listen to that one. Um, we're going to go into a brand new, uh, brand new passage, brand new message this morning for this service. Uh, but if you want to go back and check that out sometime, feel, feel free to do that. Um, Jesus often said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he said that, it means she too, okay? Because how many women out there know, okay? Whole Bible's for us as well. She who has eyes to see, let her see. The scripture says this repetitively. Jesus personally in scripture multiple, like multiple times says that. And... I pondered that this week as I was preparing this message, and I really felt, you know, like the Lord had laid on my heart to do two unique messages. I've never even done that before, you know, at a church, but I really felt like it was supposed to happen this week. And uh, for whatever reason, that's what I think the Lord had in store for us. I was pondering that thought. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. I was asking the Lord, you know, what is that? What is that about, God? What is that about for us this morning? Um, did you know that the radio stations, it's a pretty incredible thing, you know, like eh, we have all this crazy technology now, um, where, you know, we can stream things wherever we are and all of that. But I want you to go back a little bit in your mind to just a old fashioned antenna for a second. Can we do that for a little bit in here? Isn't it amazing to you that the radio waves are happening all the time. Like, where I'm from in Lakeland, we have Joy FM. Do you guys have Joy FM here? Or what, what is it here that you guys have? Is it Joy FM? Okay. Let's use Joy FM for an example. All right. Or any of your favorite radio stations. Did you know that right now in this room, Joy FM is playing? But it takes an antenna to hook up to the system to be able to catch those radio waves and listen to the music. In other words, if you didn't have an antenna, you would totally miss Joy FM. But with the antenna up and turned on, you can connect to those radio waves, which are all around us. I mean, they're invisible, by the way. Like, they're literally in the room with us now. That's why, that's how the radio works. Like, it's connecting to something that's already in the air. It's already there. And boom, it connects to it and plugs in. And wow, you hear the music. Jesus says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Is he being sarcastic? No, I, I don't think so. I do think that Jesus, you know, um, he didn't pull back punches very much whenever he would speak, especially to religious leadership, Pharisees, things like that. But I think whenever he was saying that, he was saying it out of complete love and sincerity. There was a point behind it. There was a point to say, hey, let's turn the antenna on. 
Because if we don't have the antenna on, you could miss the words of God. And they're in the air. We want, I don't know about you, but there's been many times in my life I'm praying. I'm saying, God, please speak to me about this. Please help me to know what direction to go. I remember whenever I was in college or even just even prior to college, just trying to decide what college to go to. You know, do you go to be a gator? Do you go to be a hurricane? You know, what, are you, what do you go for? I mean, what do you guys think? I'm saying, no, I'm just playing. I, I, I think I know what room it, it, this is. And, and, and when you're making a decision, right, uh, in your life, you say, have you ever just had that moment where you're like, God, what do I do? Can you speak to me? You know, I mean, everything that's from a small decision of, man, what job should I take to, hey, man, I've got a family member who is sick and passing away. And God, where are you? Where are you in this situation? I mean, my, my, uh, my father-in-law, we've been, you know, dealing with a sickness for the last uh, four or five years now. And um, it's just this craziest thing. He's got a very rare illness called MSA, and it cripples your body. He's mentally completely there just all the way like very sharp incredible memory he's the smartest person I know um, and it has the sharpest memory of anybody I think I've ever met in my life but he's completely bedridden he's got to be fed by spoon every meal he ever eats he's on a complete liquid diet and he's been laying in a bed for two years unable to get up and how many times have my wife and I you know gone to God and said God what is this about have you had those moments in your life where you say, God, what is this about? Will you speak into this? Will you speak into this situation in my life? Will you tell me what's going on? I need a word from you, Lord. Have you ever had that happen to you? Have you ever felt that in your life, that weight? I feel like what Jesus is trying to say to us in those short little few phrases, he who has ears to hear, let him hear, is it's actually not sarcastic, it's actually love. It's actually him saying, son, daughter, just listen, I'm speaking. I'm speaking to you. Part of it, a lot of it, primarily most of it, is right here. Saying, hey, I gave this to you. You know, I've oftentimes been a dad now of a two-year-old, and now I've got another one on the way. I've thought about what kind of things I might want to leave for my kids, you know, like just want to be a really intentional dad. And I'm trying to think like, man, what, what can I leave for my kids? Like I've already started to write her letters, you know, that I want her to open up one day later in life. And, you know, you, I mean, I plan on being around, you know, Lord willing, but, but Hey, if something happened to me, I want her to have stuff in her hands that she can say, my dad said this about me. My dad said this about me. Listen, this book is a love letter between God Almighty, the Lord Almighty, the creator of the universe, the creator of your heart, the creator of your being that you are, every cell in your body, every star in the sky, every blade of grass outside, every whale in the ocean, everything that is happening in the universe is under the palm of his hand. He's spoken into existence. He knitted you together in your mother's womb. Everything about you. God is aware of and he has given you a love letter to say I'm going to speak to you and he's chosen to do it in this way now yes God can use a prophet yes God can speak to you in your personal experience yes God can use other means and he can give people dreams he can give people visions I am not in denial of that I have, I, I have seen God do stuff like that but the primary way I'm here to tell you the primary way that God will ever speak to his people is right in his word. Because he doesn't change. Heaven and earth may pass away, but my word will stay the same. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. It says in Hebrews, the word of God is for you. These passages, these books, these stories, they're not ancient stories just for the sake of being history. This isn't like your American history book, which I think, by the way, is extremely important, especially if we can get real history books, you know, back in our schools. But this book is absolutely crucial. This is life and death. This is written to be written on your heart, inscribed on your being, to be forever treasured by you and your family. If there's anything you ever want to do for your children, I was a youth pastor for a decade. 
If there's anything you ever want to do for your children, you want to do for generations ahead of you, you want to set a new tone for your family, you want to break things that's been hanging over your family for years. See, I come from a family of mostly divorced marriages. I mean, generationally. And in my heart, I'm saying, no, it's going to stop here. Lord willing, I mean, that's up to my wife too, right? Like, we're in this together. I can't just be the only one here. But thank God, I think I got a pretty good one. You know, she's amazing. She's, I, I really married up, actually. <laughs> she, uh, she, the Lord uses her primarily to speak to me, I think, outside of the Word of God. <laughs> she's probably that person, you know, and he will use your wife and stuff like that. But my point is, if you want to do something amazing for your family, you want to make a legacy for your life, you want to be the person God's called you to be, have the ears to hear this book. Have the ears to hear the stories that God's put in front of your heart. Because the answers that you're looking for are actually not that far away. And that's what Jesus is trying to tell you. He's just trying to say, hey, I'm speaking. But you got to click the antenna on. you got to tune in. you got to wake up. And that's not a mean thing. That's a thing in love to say. He's saying, I have spoken. And there's a chance you're missing it. So don't miss it. Don't miss it. And with that, I'd like to turn our attention to Joshua chapter 2, okay? So if you got your Bible, turn with me to Joshua chapter 2. We're going to look at this passage together. Now we're going to read through the chapter together this morning, and I'm just going to read straight through it. Um, but I want to give a little context of what's going on, especially uh, in this part of the scripture. So you have the story of Israel where these slaves in Egypt for 400 years were delivered by the Lord. He heard their cry, a people group that was completely oppressed, all right? Right, by, uh, by the Egyptians, and God uses a man who was the perfect candidate. He was a Hebrew among those people, but he grew up as an Egyptian. His name was Moses, and he goes to Moses at 80 years old and says, I will use you at this burning bush. It's a miraculous event in the book of Exodus. Check it out. It's an incredible story. By the way, the best stories are in the Bible. Anybody know that? I mean, the best stories are in the Bible. It's incredible what, 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 what we find in there. He goes to Moses, and he says, I'm going to use you. Moses is like, no, you're not. And he's like, yes, I am. I'm going to use you. Unlikely candidate you think you are. I'm going to use you. I'm going to empower you. You're going to go back to Egypt and deliver my people. And God does it. And he uses him. And he, he delivers the nation of Egypt. Well, God does. But he uses Moses. Moses is dying. And he's on a mountain. And he's looking across this land that God had the whole time said, I'm going to take you out of Egypt. But I, I've got a place for you. You're not going to be nomads. There's a place in what we now call Palestine. It was, the, it was this land, and God called it the land of milk and honey. He said, I've got this set aside for you, and I'm going to bring you to this land. There's seven nations there now, but they have done such wicked behavior that I'm going to take them off of the face of the earth, and I'm going to place you there in that spot. And so if you listen to me, and you, you obey me, and you go the way that I have planned for you, I have already made a covenant with your forefathers that this will happen. And so most Moses is dying on his, you know, basically deathbed, and he's looking at, he's on a mountain, he's looking across the mountain knowing that this is it, and he's lived his whole life up to this moment, now the people are ready to go, and God says, Moses, you're not going over into that land with them, but your protege is, you see, because this is not about you, this is about generations ahead of you, this is about what God is doing in the whole world, this is not just about city light. This is about Gainesville. This is about Florida. This is about what God's doing globally too, right? Amen? You know, God has a plan for creation. So Moses is there and he passes the torch. God uses this man named Joshua to be the guy that leads Israel into that land. And when they do, Joshua is ready, and he's a, a ready servant. He steps into those shoes like unable, like I can't even, like uh, if you think about just it, how hard it is to follow a great leader, it's really hard to do, you know, because you get compared to them constantly. Joshua lived up to the challenge. I mean, just so many times over and over again, just such an incredible leader. Stepped into the shoes of Moses and led the people, and God used him and did an incredible thing. But in this passage where we are, he is is, he's been called by God. He knows it. They're in the land, and they come to the first place. The first place they go to is a little town called Gilgal, and that was my first message this morning. 
was about that place. But they're sitting there in that place, and across the way is Jericho, their first city to conquer. And of the cities in the land, probably the most hardest city to conquer. Like, it's fortified with incredible walls. It's impenetrable. You, you, these people are greater, more mighty, more numerous than the Israelites. These people have all the things that they need to have to defend themselves against those nomads that's been out in the wilderness with sticks. All right? They have all the canyons, and they've got all the little tiny stuff. Israel doesn't seem to stand a chance against a threat like this. But yet, Joshua knows, the people of God know, when God says something, it's going to happen. And so they find themselves at this little place called Gilgal, waiting. And Joshua says, I'm going to send some spies, and this is the story. So let's read it together. Joshua chapter 2 says, Now Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out two men from the Acacia Grove, which was where they were at in that little town, to spy secretly saying, go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho saying, behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. Doesn't look like those spies did a very good job, right? Like they got caught on the first day. <laughs> what is, what's going on, man? You're supposed to be CIA undercover, right? No, they got caught first day. So verse three says, so the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, knew exactly where they were at. And he said, bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out the country. Then the woman took the two men and hid them. So she said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And it happened as the gate was being shut, when it was dark, that the men went out. Where the men went, I don't know. Pursue them quickly, for you might overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. Then the men pursued them by the road to the Jordan to the fords. And as soon as those who pursued them had gone out, they shut the gate. Now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, now this is key, listen to this from this Canaanite prostitute woman running a parlor for human trafficking. All right, among the seven nations that God said were the wickedest seven nations that ever lived on the earth. The only time, by the way, that God has ever said to eliminate nations and people groups was those seven nations. No other time in all of scripture. It was just the seven Canaanite nations that lived in the land of Palestine. Um, there's a lot of theories behind why God would have said to do that. Uh, some people say that, well, and there's actually archaeological proof. Uh, they've pulled up plots of ground where these Canaanite nations used to kill children, unborn babies, all right, a lot of abortion, but also a lot of human sacrifice, all right, to their gods, and in one little small plot of ground, you know, a 10 by 10 area, the archaeologists had discovered hundreds of baby bones in these places where these people group lived. They were some of the most evil people group, probably the most evil people groups that ever walked on the earth, but they were humanly very powerful, very threatening. The Israelites saw them like giants. That's where God Goliath comes from, by the way. You know the story David and Goliath? Goliath was one of those people. He was a Canaanite. He was, he was a Philistine. Philistine was one of those seven nations. All right? Other ones were called Jebusites, Hivites, Amorites. These were all people groups among those seven nations that God said was the only time that God said completely eliminate them. And among those people is this, this, what the Bible calls a harlot or a prostitute, Rahab. So even among her own people group, even among the most wicked people on earth, she's also a lower caste part of that group. And she's even more wicked probably than most and running a pretty wicked show. Then this happens. But listen to this statement that she makes. This is the heart of the message. In verse 8, or verse 9, I'm sorry, she says, I know that the Lord has given you the land that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. She's recording history. She's heard stories. She's witnessed the accounts of what God has already done through Israel. She, she's heard. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is a God 
He is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Now therefore I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you will also show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token. Give me some sign that I can count on you. I'm showing you kindness is what she's saying. Give me some sign I can count on you. And spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. So the men answered her, Our lives for yours, if none of you tell this business of ours. And it shall be when the Lord has given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall. And she dwelt on the wall. Now, if you know anything about the story of Jericho, that was the walls that came down, okay? Israelites go marching around the wall. It's the most incredible battle of all time. The only thing was, there's, there was no battle. <laughs> it, it was the most incredible feat of all time. Archaeologists are still not in agreement over what happened at Jericho. And, of course, you got a ton of people who just don't believe the Bible story. But you got a lot of people that are like, yeah, it pretty much lines up. The walls have come down. It's, everything's crashed. There's a, there was a point in time where they were there, and there's there's a point in time, and they're gone, and they're flattened, and God says, you know, march around it, and on the seventh day, march around it seven times, and boom, it happened, and I mean, he came, and, and it, was, it, was, it was a God moment, undeniable God moment, like, whenever that happens, by the way, and God has all ability to do that at any time, at any place in history, God does miracles today, just like he did miracles yesterday, I don't believe that Jesus just healed blind eyes then and doesn't do it now, do you believe that God still works miracles today, does anybody in this house have the faith to say, man, come on, I believe in a God who's still working, still moving, still able today. But they're there in this city, and she said, that it says she, her house was on the city wall, and she dwelt on the wall, and she's letting them down from this rope. We're just going to finish up the chapter. It says, and she said to them, get to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you. Hide there three days. Until the pursuers have returned, afterward you might go your way. So the men said to her, We will be blameless of this oath of yours which you have made us swear, unless when we come into the land you bind this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down, and unless you bring your father, mother, brothers, and all your household to your own home. Um, Basically, I'm going to summarize it this way before we don't even have to read the rest of the story there. You can, when you know, anytime you want. Basically, they have this agreement. And long story short, everything that God said was going to happen happens. The walls come down, but there's one little piece sticking up. And guess whose house it is? The, the house of Rahab. And her house is standing strong, and she's done exactly what she was asked to do by those two spies. She brought her whole household, her whole family, her whole her father, her brothers, sisters, everything they have, all the little ones, and they're all there in her house. I mean, her people must have thought she was crazy. Her own people must have thought she was ridiculous. Like, you, 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 you know, you're, it's pathetic to think that these guys would come in here and obliterate our walls. We are fortified. We're strong. We got, I mean, how many, does this sound familiar a little bit? You know, I, I, th I think we're living in a very similar time where the idea of God, it, 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 some people just don't even entertain it because they feel like, oh, America, man, like we've got everything we could ever need. Why do we need God? We've got technology. Have you seen the missiles? Have you seen the, you know, the ideas we have for going to outer space? I mean, we're trying to be God. And Jericho was in that place of pride. That Jericho was in that place where that, you know, that's exactly where they were. But this one woman, this one prostitute woman, something in her, in a moment, changed. Her whole life before that moment was a life of wickedness, was a life of treachery, was a life of probably abuse and torment. And we know how people end up in human trafficking. What a, what a, you know, what a story each of those women have. This woman noticed something. The antenna started to come on. She saw two men and thought to herself, there's something different about this. There's something different about this. You see, when God does something in your life, you don't need other people to tell you that it's true. You know it. 
when you see a move of God, when God is really up to something, you know it when you see it. Why? Because he made you. It's your maker talking to you. God doesn't need other means to speak to you, but he does it through his word. Why is his word penetrating hearts still today? This, some of this Bible was written 3,500 years ago. 2,000 years ago. Why is it that we're every weekend, thousands of churches around this globe today are preaching out of this book? Why? Because it penetrates hearts. Because God's speaking. Because God's working. And because when he does it, I'm a living proof testimony, guys. I was 18 years old. I grew up in the church my whole life, but I was 18 years old when I rededicated my heart to the Lord. And I said, God, I haven't been living the way you want me to live, but I want to. And I was broken before him, lost in my identity. But all of a sudden, I just surrendered my life to God. And it's never been the same since. Now, it's been a very hard road sometimes, but it's never been the same. When God is up to something, you know it. You see it. There's a part of your heart, even now in this service, there's a part of your heart that says something about this says, man, that's real. That's real. Now, doubt always tries to creep in, and that's why we live on faith, you know? Of course, it would be nice if God popped out of the sky and said, hey, everybody, like, yeah, I'm real, I'm here. But what faith would that require? What is all this about? Why does God do it this way? Because he loves faith. He loves it when he sees the children and they believe in God, and you don't have to try to give them a million reasons why. You say, God is real, and there's something in them that understands that. You know why? Because it's in them. It's in us. We're stamped with a thumbprint of God on our heart. And Rahab had that same thumbprint. Just because God said to eliminate these seven people groups didn't mean he didn't care about them. We don't know what sort of grace God extended to them. I know this, based on the Bible, God is a God of grace and love. What would they have had to do for him to get to that point? That must have been an incredible amount of wickedness for him to get to that point. But even at that point, there's one woman who is living proof that that could have been anybody. Anybody could have been Rahab. And that's the point of the story. Anybody could have been the one that said, no, everybody else can go, but I'm going to serve the Lord. Anybody, anybody could have been her. I don't know what your life looks like. I don't know what your family looks like. I know my family, psh, dysfunction, the, the, the roots I come from. I mean, I love my family. But I know everybody. David's family in the Bible, full of dysfunction. Okay, Moses' family, there was stuff going on. I mean, you pick out a character, all of our families are dysfunctional, by the way. There's not a, there's not a perfectly normal family out there. That's something I did learn about youth ministry <laughs> whenever I was doing it. There's not a normal family out there, okay? We've all got our quirks. We've all got our weird stuff. We've all got our faults and failures. Listen, God knows it. God sees it. God loves you. God's with you. But the thing is, like, like anybody, all it takes is for one person to say, yes, God, I will. Maybe nobody else will go, but I'll go. Maybe everybody else in America is saying that we don't need you. But there's something in here that I can't deny. There's something about the story of Jesus that just sticks out. There's something about the cross that I just can't look past. There's something about that moment that I had whenever I was in that worship service that was real. And I know it. We need more people to be like Rahab. This woman, see, <laughs> had an incredible story, by the way. After that, she was saved. Her and her entire family. It's amazing what can happen when one person starts saying it, God, I'm going to do it your way. It's amazing what could happen in their children's lives, in their siblings' lives, in their parents' lives. I have witnessed some of my students that have gone out and like their whole family never went to church, full of like atheists, agnostics. They got saved. Their dad got saved. Their mom got saved. Their sisters got saved. And then they, you know, the whole family's coming to church. Isn't that amazing when God does that? He can do that with one person. With one willing heart that says, 
Oh, the antenna just came on. My antenna just came on. Jesus, I hear it. I hear it. You've been saying it all my life. I'm te- like, I'm teaching my daughter, you know, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible told me so. Why am I doing that? I'm trying to drill it in her head, in her heart, like my, my dad did to me. I mean, I, I'm a result of the prayers of people who have went before me. They weren't perfect, but they drilled that in, and somehow that stuck. It took a while. Sometimes what you're doing, it may not seem like it's happening, but it's, it's going to get in because we're made by him. We're made. He knows our design. He's created us. He's the maker of heaven and earth. And so one person that says, God, I'll be like Rahab. I'll step out. She, do you know what she risked? She risked everything. She had to put herself in an incredibly compromising situation with the king of the, the, the town of Jericho who approached her. She could have gave in at any moment and sold them out and they would have been dead. But something inside said, no, no, this is real. Something inside, and she didn't have the Bible, by the way. Like, we're privileged <laughs> because we have the Bible. I think we have to stand before God about that, too, because, like, we have a blessing that not many other generations have had. We have more access to the scriptures. I've met, I, there are people on, on planet Earth, I love doing missions, you know, and there are people on planet Earth still that don't have the Bible in their own language, but they'll get an English version of the Bible. I have personally, like, seen of people that, like, will tear out a page of an English Bible. Bible, they don't understand a word of it, but they carry it around everywhere they go in their country because that's like life. We don't know what we have. Like, this is life, man. This is everything. And God is breathing on this being translated in every, you know, language on earth right now. It's something to sow into as a people, but that's not the point. That's a side note. What I'm, say- what I'm saying is that when God is up to something... No man can stop it. And this woman picked up on that. She risked everything for that. And you can too. In your own life. Yeah. Will it cost a lot to follow Jesus? Absolutely it will. You know what it will cost you? Everything. Did Jesus hold back that punch whenever he was here? No. Many times he turned back and told them that exact message and half the people left. The majority of the people left. Walked out. Why? Because he was real with us from the start. This is going to cost you everything. This will cost you your life to follow Jesus. But it's real. Do you want the real thing? It won't cost you much to be a fake Christian. It won't cost you much to be a halfway hearted Christian. But it will cost you everything to be a fully like committed Christian. It will cost you everything. It could cost you relationships. It could cost you jobs. It could cost you everything you have. Things that you love, that you're idolizing in your life now instead of, instead of worshiping God. Addictions. It'll cost you those. God wants to break that. Why? Because he loves you. He knows you. He says, that's not what I made you for. I made you for greater. And I'm going to bring you to that. But you've got to lay everything else aside and follow me. Rahab lived a life, a crazy life. But she was willing. She stepped out in faith, willing to lay it all down. And when she did, this is what happened. I want to read to you some passages later on in Scripture. This is what it says of her. Later on in the story, in the book of Joshua, chapter 6, when Jericho falls down, it says in verse 25 of chapter 6, And Joshua spared Rahab the harlot, her father's household, and all that she had. So she dwells in Israel to this day, because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. God honored her. And, and truthfully, what happened is she became a part of Israel. And I, I don't have the time to go into it, but theologically, I mean, I'm not one to get political, so I'm not going to. But I will say this. Um, the pulpit isn't a place for it. And I think that's the, that's the reason why I don't get political at all, at all up here. I don't really care too much about politics. But what I do know is Israel is a people. 
It's not just a place. It's, it represented in Scripture the people of God. Anybody could have been part of Israel if they leaned in. And Rahab is proof of that. She was a completely pagan Canaanite woman. And that Scripture says she became a part of Israel. To the point that this next verse happens. In Matthew chapter 1, verses 5 through 6, Matthew is recounting the genealogy of Jesus. You guys hear me still? Oh, sorry. The mic, I thought, was doing something different. But Matthew is recounting the genealogy of Christ, and it says this. Salmon, <laughs> Salmon, pretty nice name, right? <laughs> Anybody hungry? No. Salmon begot Boaz. By who? Rahab. Can you believe that? That's the same Rahab. She is the great, 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 so many greats to the however many tenths of Jesus. Of Jesus. Not only did God honor this woman and save her life, he saved her future. He made her a part of the family of Christ himself. The biggest like promise that humanity has ever had is that God would send his son to redeem us. And he did it through the line of this woman. This Canaanite prostitute woman. What do you think he can do for me and you? This woman of the people group specifically that God said eliminate. Anybody could have been a Rahab. But they were unwilling. And that's the point. Guys, by the way, Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus was crucified by people who hated him. Some of them later on got saved. Some of them didn't. Why? Because some of, there are, there's a reality here. God will not force you. God will not pop out of the sky and say, to dominate you and say, you will. No, he's never going to do that. He never has done that. He will not do that. Not in this life. Now in the next, once we pass from this world, the scriptures say every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. But in this life, he will not pop out of the sky. Why? Because it requires faith to believe in Jesus. He's not going to just say, because if he did... Every time that God has showed up, by the way, people fall on their face and they feel like they're going to die because of the glory, because he's amazing, because he's beyond. I mean, have you seen a star? Like, can you, if we were to go outside right now and stare straight up at the sun, tell me how long it would take before you feel like you're going blind and think about God that he just said, let it be. And it was there. Every star that burns in the sky. And our sun, by the way, astrologers say that it's one of the smaller ones. There are stars out there that are beyond our comprehension of how big they actually are. And you know what God said? Let it be. The universe has no end. Like, we're just going to keep getting bigger telescopes to show us that it, there is no end. How big do you think God is? If he popped out of the sky and said, I'm real, we'd be terrified. And people have been. The scriptures tell us that. He's not going to do that. He will not force you to have a relationship with him. It has to come from a willing heart on your part. And as I close, I'm going to close on this. You and I, the greatest power that we have as people, the absolutely most powerful thing about you is that you were made in the image of God. And you know what that means? This is what the image of God is like in you. God has given you a God-like feature. And that feature is called free will. The power that you have to choose your destiny is the greatest power that you possess. God is the king of the entire universe and no one will remove him from his throne. No matter what, nobody can, nobody will. Even Satan himself, the Bible says the demons tremble. They can't, there's no competition there. God wins in the end. Here's the, here's the essence of revelation in the end times, okay? You want to know what it really is? Here it is in one statement, God wins. We can all agree on that. There's 12 different ways to know how that's going to happen, but <laughs> he's going to win. That's the truth. Listen. There are people who have heard the gospel, who have had God-like moments, who have been in the midst of revival and watched it pass by. Watched it pass by. There are people, I, I mean, I guess, 
I have tried so many times, especially as a pastor, to like put myself in people's shoes and say, wow, well, there's trauma. Well, you know, they, they, their, their parents were this way. All they, you know, and, and one of the most sourest things that happens to people is that they knew of a Christian who tainted it for them. And, and really messed it up. And that's why City Light, like, like Jesus said, be a light. I love your name. I love your name of the church. Be a light. It's, you're shining. People are watching you. You don't know what's going to happen because one day, you're, me and you, we're going to be dead and gone. And there's going to be other people that you impacted. And will that be for the positive or for the negative in eternity? You're a light. You're shining one way or the other. Are you living out what you say you are? Are you a Christian? Are you like all in, man? Are you, are, I mean, you're not going to be perfect. Sometimes I know my preaching, like I've, I've known myself because I, I just feel like, like I don't want you to get the impression I'm like, oh, you got to be perfect. No, that's not what I'm saying. Listen, I'm the most imperfect person in this room. I'm the chief of sinners in this room. I've struggled with addictions. I've been through all kinds of trauma. I've had to go through life, and me and my wife, we've been married for four years. Our first year, we thought that was it. Like, I thought we were going to get a divorce. I was like, here I go. I'm following my family history. I thought that was it. I'm not perfect, man. I don't think that, that that's not the point. The point is, is that God is real. And he's wanting to do something incredible. I'm a living, breathing testimony that the power of God in your life can redeem things that you didn't think could be redeemed, can save things that you didn't think could be saved, can heal things that you didn't think could be healed. You got to say yes. You got to use the power that God has put in your hands. And he, he's a gentleman. He will not force you. You got to say yes. He's got the door open for you, but you got to walk through it. And there's a lot of people that watch him put the door open and willingly, cold-heartedly, sincerely walk away from God. Of those examples, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, yeah, the scriptures say he hardened his heart, but Pharaoh's heart was already hard. God just brought him to his ultimate end. What do you think hell is about? Hell is not just this place that God has fun with. Hell is bringing people to what they want. You want a life without God? You don't want to involve Him? You want to run away from Him? Run as far as you can because that's where hell is. It's as far away from God as you can get. And every person that doesn't want anything to do with God, that's where the, that's, that's just what's, that's the, the, the train. It's not an unloving thing. It's a real thing. It's a biblical thing. It's an undeniable truth of Scripture. This thing, man, is so important. I know I'm probably getting close to time, but I just felt the impression on my heart right now to spend that time to tell you that. The impression on my heart to renew your faith. If you're in this room and you've been a Christian for a long time, God's not done with you yet. There's things that he wants you to be bold in. Bold. If you're new, if you're not a believer yet, he brought you here. This isn't an accident. You're in this room right now because God wants to speak to you. And I'm not God, but he's using this message maybe to, in, to, to, to talk to you in some way. And you know, I've, I've witnessed enough time for he might have spoke something to you I didn't even say. And I was like, that's great. That's how the Holy Spirit works. God is moving. He's working. But the antennas got to come on. He who has an, the ears to hear... Let him hear. That's what Jesus says. Let him hear. Rahab, another passage in Hebrews chapter 11. She stands among the hall of fame of faith. Hebrews 11 is a, is a hall of fame. It's like everybody in there that, that they said, wow, this person had incredible faith. Of Rahab in verse 31 of that chapter, it says, By faith the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter where you come from, no matter what your professor at school has tried to tell you. I've sat, I mean, I, I'm, I've got a couple master's degrees and whatever. I mean, I've been through enough college to know, like, yeah, we, we got, we got, that, that's a real thing. Like, there's professors out there that just try to make you look stupid for being a Christian. It's not stupid. There's logic behind it. There's a lot behind this. Most people are just afraid of it. 
because of everything that it'll mean. If I have to turn my heart and my life over to God, it'll mean everything. It'll cost me everything. I love you, church. I don't know all of you like personally. I haven't sat in your living rooms, but I know people. And I've ministered to people and I can see the heart of this church. And I know that you guys are heading in an incredible direction. Lean in. Be a Rahab man and your family, don't quit. At school, when you're in that class and you feel like, yeah, I just don't know the answer to that. That's a great question, professor. Like, that's a great question. I don't know the, the logical answer to that. But you know what? I'll search. I'll find out. Because one thing I know, that moment, undeniable. The move of God I witnessed, undeniable. Your personal testimony, by the way, nobody can say nothing about that. Nobody can t tell me that God didn't move in my life. Because I know who I was, and I know who I am. One man that Jesus healed, I love it, this dude. All he said, they brought him before the religious leaders, and they were all mad. Who did this to you? Oh, yeah? How do you know he was real? He said, all I know is, I was blind, now I see. <laughs> I was blind, now I'm seeing stuff. Tell me how it works out for you. Get a people in a room together that are all completely unbelievers and ask me one by one, do you feel like your life is better since you've been an unbeliever? Like since you've walked away from Jesus, tell me the fruit of your life. Do you feel like things have gotten better for you? But you get me in a room full of people, full of believers that say, I was blind and now I see. My life was without Christ and my addictions are gone. My life was without Christ and my marriage is saved. Come on. If you believe the power of God can do these kinds of things, come on, stand your feet with me in this room. If you don't mind, stand to your feet with me. If you believe that God is a God of grace and mercy, of power and love, and you say, I'm going to be that type of person in my life, it's like a Rahab. I'm going to be that type of person in my life that, man, I'm going to say yes. When Jesus says, lean in, I'm going. When Pastor Josh, you know, gives the word of the Lord, man, I'm listening. When Dominic's leading worship, man, I'm going to be worshiping. We need people like Rahab. We need a lot more of them. And that's, God is wanting more open hearts that he can use, more antennas on. Amen. Can I pray for you this morning? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes for a moment.